today's the day of the show, and I'm walking to work. This is my commute. How somebody gets to work is called a commute. Follow along on mine. This is my commute. This is my commute. Man. Hey, Tim. Hey, are you heading towards the museum? Air in space? Yeah. Yeah, hop on in. Great. Seatbelt. My commute. Hey, Piers, you would not believe my commute this morning. Whoa! Come on! <laughs> you call that a commute? You should have seen my ride. Go for main engine start. Six, five. Four, three, two, one, and zero, and liftoff of Space Shuttle Atlantis, reaching the crest of its historic achievements in space. Wow, that was some commute, but I'll bet it was a lot longer than mine. Yeah, well, the mileage was further, but it only took eight minutes. That's going fast. Wow, I'm just glad I made it here in time for the show. Ooh, when does the show start? It's right now. This, this is STEM in 30. Hi, I'm Marty Kelsey. And I'm Beth Wilson, and we are coming to you live from the National Air and Space Museum. Today we are in the Moving Beyond Earth Gallery, and this gallery is amazing. There are all kinds of artifacts that have flown in space in this gallery, and one of my favorites is this space shuttle main engine. There are three of these on the orbiter, and each of them produces over 400,000 pounds of thrust. You couple that with the two external boosters, and it gets you into space really fast. Also in this gallery, there's a little green space ranger that's been in space that you might recognize. I think you know him as Buzz Lightyear. And you guys, our friends from Luther Jackson Middle School, will have some time to look for Buzz Lightyear after the show. We'd, we'd like to welcome our online viewers today. Thank you guys for watching and all of the viewers on NASA TV. And also remember that you can participate today online. Go to our website and you can submit questions. We have an expert standing by downstairs ready to answer those questions, and some of them we'll actually use on the show today. In today's episode, we're going to be looking at living and working in space. And to get us started, let's take a look at the outpost we have up there right now, the International Space Station. I am standing in front of the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. We collect artifacts on space and aviation history, but there's one artifact that we can't collect. That's the International Space Station. Right now it's orbiting 250 miles above the Earth. To get an idea of how big it is, let's bring it a little bit closer. Traveling at over 17,500 miles per hour, the station completes one orbit every 90 minutes. It is powered by a solar array that covers more than an acre. It has taken over 180 spacewalks to construct the station, which weighs more than a million pounds. There are 52 computers on board, as well as over eight miles of wires connecting electrical power systems. The livable area of the space station is about the same as a six room house. It has two bathrooms, a gym, and a 360 degree window. The space station has been continuously occupied for almost 15 years. It has been home to astronauts from 15 different countries. Currently, there is a crew of six on board, including Mikhail Koryenko and Scott Kelly, who are spending an entire year in space. Together, they are part of 10 separate investigations to study the subtle and not so subtle effects of spaceflight on the human body. 
The space station is truly an international endeavor with 68 countries all running different experiments. Everything from human biology to biochemistry to physical sciences. Who knows what sorts of wonderful discoveries will come from these? I'd like to introduce our guest today, Dr. Valerie Neal. She is the chair of the Space History Department here at the National Air and Space Museum. Thank you so much for joining us today. So our theme today is living and working in space. Right. Tell us a little bit about the day-to-day -day activities of actually living in space. The day-to-day -day activities in space are a lot like those here on Earth. Uh, the astronauts wake up, they clean up, they have breakfast, they go to work, take a lunch break, work some more, uh, come back for dinner, maybe do a little exercise, maybe have a little recreation or entertainment and relaxation in the evening and go to sleep. So what they do is not all that different than what we do here on a typical day, but where they do it and how they do it is what is different. It seems like things that we take for granted here that are really simple here on Earth become much more complex when you get into space. That's true, they become different. Uh, not necessarily more complex, but different because when you're in space, of course, you're weightless and everything around you is weightless. Things float unless they are held in place and that changes everything. You have to think more about the things you're doing. And you also have to make some accommodations to weightlessness. And a good example is for women astronauts, particularly those who have long hair, uh, they have to give some thought to how they wear their hair in space. If I were there right now, this hair would be floating out all around my head in a halo. But if I had long hair, it would be really floating around. It might get in my eyes, it might tickle your nose, it might get tangled up in some of the equipment. So NASA made a rule that people with long hair in space need to keep their hair confined in a ponytail with a scrunchie, a headband, a barrette. Uh, that has affected really only the women astronauts so far because most of the men go up with short hair. But we actually have a scrunchie on display in this gallery that was worn by one of the female astronauts in space. So that's one example of things you have to do a little differently. No. Eating is something that all the astronauts have to do in space, but even that's become different being in orbit. That's different as well, and the reason is there's no refrigerator nor, nor a freezer on board. So all the food has to be prepared in advance and packaged in a way that it won't spoil. Uh, so the food they use is a lot like the food that soldiers use. Uh, when they're on active duty or that you might use when you go camping. And it's all prepared, it's just ready to be warmed up. Uh, if it's in a packet like this, or if it's in a packet like this, it just needs to have some water added. Squinch it all around to make sure that it dissolves and suddenly you have a fruit drink or you have macaroni and cheese or oatmeal, uh, whatever, by adding water. And you don't really need a whole set of silverware. You need a spoon and a pair of scissors because after you have uh, prepared your food, you need to snip into it, open it up so you can get a spoon in there and eat it so it won't go floating away. They don't use dishes, they don't use cups, glasses, uh, nothing that has to be cleaned up afterwards. You eat right out of the packages and then throw it all in the trash. Interesting. Uh, now, one of the no things cleanup. that the astronauts really enjoy to do, they all kind of have the same thing they like to do in their free time when they're in space? Yes, it's surprising. Their favorite leisure activity is just simply to look out the window because think of the view, our incredible Earth below them. Uh, they're flying over it at 17,500 miles an hour. In an hour and a half, they can go entirely around the world, see all the continents, see day and night, lightning, uh, places where people live and places that are so remote they're hard to get to, so they love watching the Earth. That's amazing. So we've got some questions that we're going to ask, and we're going to start with a video question from Benjamin Banneker Elementary School in Kansas City, Kansas. Hi, my name is Flavor, and my question is, how do you exercise out of space? How do you exercise in space? Very good question. You have a gym uh, right inside the International Space Station. There are three pieces of equipment. Uh, one is a treadmill, one is a stationary bicycle, and one is a weightlifting machine, uh, basically. The bicycle, of course, has no wheels. It's just one you sit on and pedal to your heart's content. 
Uh, but you have to use bungee cords and seat belts and straps of various kinds to stay on the equipment to get your resistance exercise because otherwise you just float off of it. All right, we've got an online question next. Do astronauts know if it's day or night? Astronauts do know if it's day or night simply by looking out the window, but what's day or night on the Earth may not be day or night for them. Uh, they're operating on their own 24-hour cycle, and it's kind of independent of whether it's light or dark outside. It's based on the clock. Okay. We've got an audience question next. Um, have there ever been any problems with spacesuits? Have there been any problems with spacesuits? Occasionally there are problems with spacesuits um, not fitting quite properly or um, the equipment that runs the spacesuit to circulate the air, circulate the water may develop a problem, but the astronauts have spacesuit repair kits on board and if they're having a problem they can fix it or there's always a spare spacesuit so they can just use a different one if their own isn't working properly. Awesome. Well, Beth had an opportunity a few days ago to talk with Paolo Nespoli, who is a two-time space flight veteran. He flew once on the space shuttle and once on a Soyuz spacecraft. So she had an opportunity to talk to him about his six months that he spent in space. Let's head over to Beth with Paolo Nespoli. Hi, I'm Beth Wilson, and I'm here with Paolo Nespoli, who is an Italian astronaut with the European Space Agency. Thank you so much for coming and talking to us today at STEM and 30. Thank you for inviting me here. It's a pleasure. No problem. We've got some questions for you. I know you spent Brady. a lot of time on the International Space Station. What was your most challenging work you had to do on the International Space Station? Well, I think uh, one of the first challenges that you get when you go in space and you stay for a long duration is that you essentially have to become an extraterrestrial person. So when the people ask me, do you believe in extraterrestrial person? Yes, I was one of them. <laughs> so you have to, to learn to live in an environment where there is no gravity, meaning that the, the actual things that we do all the time do not work up there. And, and at the beginning, you really try hard to behave the same way you behave here on Earth, and it doesn't work. You cannot do things, things are not efficient, uh, it's, it's very crazy, and things like that. And then. After a while, when you, when you understand this is a new situation, you need to explore, uh -huh. you need to try things, you need to become Superman, <laughs> fly from one place to the other and you know, do exceptional things that you cannot do here. Then that's when you actually really start working. And that's very, it's a very good challenge. Now, you flew both on the shuttle and on the Soyuz. Yes. Can you explain the difference between the two spacecraft? Um, the launch itself, uh, between the two vehicles is pretty much the same, more or less. The shuttle is a little bit rougher at the beginning, but then it smooths out, and uh, so you start very smooth, and then it gets rough at the huh. end. Uh, but, but the re-entry is totally, completely different. You know, the shuttle re-enters almost like a, a spacecraft, almost, more or less. Uh, the Soyuz instead re-enters with a parachute, uh, and the way it breaks in the atmosphere, and o everything that happens inside, in this, in this half an hour of horror, it's, uh, <laughs> it's pretty much uh, fairly rough, I would say. And, and uh, you know, you are inside there, you trained uh, from a technical point of view many, many times on Earth, but when things happen in there, you are completely, constantly surprised, and you actually kind of, whoa, what was that? Am I alive? Are we alive? And, and it keeps going like this. I usually summarize it, say that it's a sequence of catastrophic events <laughs> that happen in rapid succession <laughs> until you eventually uh, go to the last part, which is the soft landing, which is equivalent to a car crash between a truck and a car. And you know, you are in a car, not in a truck. And, and, and then you are on Earth, like, whoa, that was a that was pretty good uh, entry. What was your favorite job when you were on the International Space Station? What was your favorite thing to do? Well, uh, you know, uh, we work pretty hard when we are up there because, you know, we are one of the resources of the space station and, and on the ground, the planning team tries to make uh, the most out of this uh, laboratory and the resources. So you're pretty busy, let's say from 7.30 in the morning until 8.30 in the evening running experiments. You can be uh, either a guinea pig or, or the, the hands of the scientist or you can be going around fixing broken stuff, uh, unloading a cargo, uh, moving the robotic arm, or even go out uh, on a spacewalk if you are lucky. So uh, all of us, and I did the same, like to go to, 
to the cupola and look at the Earth when it passes by at uh, you know, eight kilometers per second, five miles a second. You can actually see in an hour and a half the old world passing under uh -huh. your feet, and that's a, an amazing view. Well, thank you so much for answering our questions today. You're welcome. Now, Paulo talked a little bit about his favorite jobs in space. Can you tell us a little bit about what those day-to-day -day jobs are that they do? Uh, sure. Uh, there are six astronauts right now on the International Space Station, and all of them are scientists or engineers. Uh, there are three laboratories that make up the International Space Station, so most of the crew is actually doing research in space. They're working on a couple of hundred experiments that have been provided by scientists all around the world. Uh, also, there'll be some housekeeping going on. Somebody always has to vacuum, uh, make sure the place is clean, or wipe down the galley uh, to make sure that any food mess is cleaned up. And uh, they may also be taking care of repairs. Uh, there are a lot of computers aboard. There's a lot of programming uh, that needs to switch. They're doing earth photography according to a, a list of targets that's sent up to them. So they are working hard for more than 12 hours a day. And they try to find some time in there to exercise as well. Uh, each person has to exercise two to three hours a day. Think of that. Now, one of the life science experiments that, that's going on right now is with a set of twins, Scott and Mark Kelly. Scott yeah. Kelly's in space and Mark Kelly is staying here on Earth. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, scientists are really interested in what happens to the human body in space, and we've not had a U.S. astronaut stay in space for an entire year before. So the fact that these twins, uh, who are actually both astronauts, uh, are available to participate in an experiment is really unique. So they're going to be tracking Scott in space. During that period of time, his bones are, and muscles are going to be changing. Uh, because of the time in weightlessness, his body will be basically at rest for a whole year, except for when he's exercising. And then his brother, who's moving around here normally on Earth. And at the end of the year, they'll be able to compare and contrast two identical bodies that have been living in different circumstances. And all of the astronauts are actually subject to experiments themselves. They are the test subjects for figuring out how does the body respond to long-term weightlessness in space. Now working inside the space station is one set of jobs, but they also work outside the space station. Well, and as Paolo said, those who are lucky get to go outside on spacewalks. Uh, some of the astronauts are trained specifically to work outside. Uh, they wear the bulky white EVA suit, extravehicular activity suit, which is like their own personal spacecraft. And in it, they can work outside for up to eight hours at a time. Uh, doing assembly or repair tasks. The entire space station was put together by astronauts working with those modules and trusses as if they were giant tinker toys. Now that it's all assembled, they have repair work to do outside. They also need to change batteries or they may, may need to move something from one end of the space station to another. Uh, so uh, I think they are fortunate to get to work outside. Uh, the rest of the time, everybody is confined inside what amount to great big cans. Um, now, now, one of the things that they use when they're working outside are tools. And to learn a little yeah. bit more about the tools that they use on these spacewalks, we're going to go over to Stim It <clears throat> to Win It. And welcome to Stim It to Win It. As Marty said, when you're in space working, you need specific tools. So what my friends here are going to do is I'm going to show them each a tool, and they're going to guess what it is. Are you all ready to go? Yes. Okay. First tool, what is this? Okay, so this would be something that would strap you on to the spacecraft is what you're thinking. Okay, well, we also put this online and we have an online poll. So let's see what our online viewer said. 100% said it was a tether. Now to answer what this actually is, we have Dr. Jennifer Lavasser. So this is an astronaut waist tether used during extravehicular activities or spacewalking. So what an astronaut would do is clip one end of it to the waist. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's a small clip on the waist of the spacesuit, and then they would clip the other end to the space station. And so it's a safety tether because it's a two-part mechanism. You have to press the buttons and then unlatch it. So that pretty much guarantees they're not going to become detached from the space station. Okay. 
Are we ready for the next one? What are these? Quickly, come with a guess. Come on, someone knows. Um, All right, what are they? What's your biscuit? Are, are they for like grabbing things? Are they for grabbing things? Actually, I thought they were bubble wands. Uh, let's see what our online poll had to say. 86% said, said they were wire ties. Let's see what Dr. Lavasser has to say. So astronauts need to use things just like we do on Earth. These are called wire ties, which may seem um, a little bit more complicated than they actually are. Just imagine trying to use a twist tie in your own home to close a garbage bag. So if astronauts need to temporarily tie something together, they can take one of these wire ties and wind it around something. And it has nice big holes on the end for them to put their gloved hands through. We've had great guesses so far. We've got one last tool. What do you all think this is? All right. Um, something like you put things in it. And something that you might put things in. Yeah. All right, let's see what our online audience thought it was. A toolbox. All right, that was the 57% thought it was a toolbox. Let's see what it is. So when astronauts are doing EVAs, they need a safe place to put even just little things that they've used up. And so this is actually a trash bag. And you can see on top, it has some elasticized closures on top so that when they put something inside, it doesn't float back out. Well, my friends did a great job here at Stim It to Win It. Now, for you all uh, at home and here in the audience, if you ever want to see the International Space Station, we're going to show you how to spot it from your own backyard. We can spot the International Space Station from our backyard, and all that we need to know is when and where to look. Let's start by going to the NASA website, spotthestation.nasa.gov. This will give us all the information we need. Now, let's try to spot the station. We see on this pass, the station will become visible at north, northwest at 8.32 p.m. Let's be sure we are on time because the space station won't wait. First, let's use our compass to find west. Now find north. Northwest is between north and west. North-northwest is between northwest and north. Okay, got it. Next, we see it's going to disappear in the east. Got that location. The entire visible pass will happen between those two areas. Now we have to determine how high it's going to be. Height is measured in degrees. There's a simple way to determine this height. Hold your hand out away from your body and make a fist. If you place the bottom of your fist on the horizon, that line where the sky meets the ground, the top of your fist will be approximately 10 degrees. You can then stack your fists on top of each other to reach 20, 30, 40 degrees or higher. Tonight, the space station will appear at 10 degrees north-northwest. If I place one fist in front of me while looking north-northwest, this is where it should first become visible. Got it. It will disappear at 20 degrees east. Right there. At its highest point, it will reach 40 degrees. Bingo! We now have a good idea of the approximate path that the space station will be traveling along. It's almost time. Let's look in the general direction of where the pass will become visible. We will scan a wider area in case we are a little off with our measurements. The station does not have lights outside that are visible from Earth. When we see it, we are actually seeing the sun reflecting off of it. Once the station becomes visible, it will take about six minutes to pass across the sky. It will not blink like an airplane. It will look like a very bright star that is traveling very fast across the sky. Here it comes. Wave to the astronauts. We have a little bit of time for more questions, and we're going to start with another video question from Banneker Elementary School in Kansas City, Kansas. Hi, my name is Lenai, and my question is, while you're working, what happens when something breaks? What happens when something breaks? 
Well, the astronauts take a lot of tools with them up to the International Space Station. Uh, there are some lockers filled with tools like you'd find in your garage or your basement, and they are well trained for all the equipment that's on board, and uh, most of them were tinkerers in their youth. They like to take things apart and put them back together, and so they can handle the repairs themselves very well. All right, we've got an online question next. What happens if an astronaut becomes sick or injured in space? Are there doctors? Uh, one of the doctors is always designated to be the, the flight um, medical officer on board, and they have a basic first aid kit. Uh, they can take care of minor injuries there. If somebody should become injured, uh, which is very, very unlikely because there are no sharp edges there, uh, and they're weightless, so they're not gonna trip and stumble on things. But if somebody should develop a, a problem that couldn't be dealt with on board, uh, they can get back to Earth pretty quickly from low Earth orbit. Uh, they can be back down on the ground in about three hours' time. So uh, fortunately, that has never happened yet. They've never had to evacuate somebody cool. to a hospital on the ground. <laughs> All right, we've got an audience question next. How does it feel emotionally and physically when you return to Earth? So how do the astronauts feel, not only physically, but also emotionally when they get back to Earth? Uh, that's a really good question because, as you might suspect, there are a whole range of, of sensations and emotions. Uh, obviously, they're glad to be back with their families and with their friends. They're glad to be home again. They're glad to eat a really good hamburger because they haven't had fresh food uh, or cooked food uh, in a long time. But they also, a lot of them say they feel a nostalgia. Uh, for the space station because it's just such an entrancing place to be. And for the first couple of days, they still feel kind of weightlessness, especially if they wake up in the night, they kind of feel like they could float out of bed and get a drink of water, and then they fall flat on the floor. Uh, so it takes a few days for that feeling of being on Earth to come back. Uh, they also say that as soon as they're back in Earth's gravity, they feel very heavy. They're really aware of the weight of the air pressure on them. Um, and uh, after being light for weeks or months at a time, that's a real sensation of being able to feel gravity. Yeah, I've heard that the sheets even feel like they're super heavy when they get back yeah. to Earth. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're out of time for today. I'd like to thank you for joining us, as well as the astronauts you saw on the show, Piers Sellers and Paolo Naspoli. We'd like to thank them, as well as curator Jennifer Lavasser for answering some questions about tools. A big thanks to you guys here in the audience. You all had some great questions today, as well as Benjamin Banneker Elementary School. Thank you guys for submitting great video questions. Don't forget, you can check out our archive on the Stimmen 30 website, where you can see shows on space junk, composites, and hot air balloons, among others. Also, I want to give a huge shout out to our crew. We have an amazing crew. It takes about 11 or 12 people to bring this show to you every, every time when we come out. So thank you to those guys. And be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for watching. I enjoyed it.